Hey everybody, happy new year and welcome to the first podcast of 2021. I'll be doing a giveaway to kick off the new year and for other reasons, more on that later. So stick to the end and hear what it's all about. For now, let's jump into what's been going on. First up is a quick update from the Make Megahertz Xbox HDMI project. It looks like things are mostly going smoothly, but they've identified a few different motherboard revisions that are having trouble. And not surprisingly, a lot of these issues have come down to what they're finding as bad capacitors. So it's no surprise to anybody that's ever worked on any aging hardware, and the original Xbox is approaching 20 years old-ish at this time, so uh, it is to be expected. If you've installed one of these and you don't have any problems whatsoever, I'd still think about at the very least recapping the power supply on the inside. And of course that one capacitor that's known to leak and dissolve onto the motherboard, which is absolutely something that you should be watching out for. Um, but just in general, every time I've done any kind of modification to any of the consoles with internal power supplies, I always try to do a power supply capacitor replacement as well. So specifically Dreamcast, PlayStation 1, and now Xbox apparently, and I guess even the Sega Saturn. Uh, anytime I try to, or anytime I install anything new, I try to always pay attention to that because capacitors absolutely will die eventually at some point. And if the you wait too long they could leak out and destroy the board so in those cases the power supplies aren't too hard to swap the caps out uh, i generally just do it and i guess you could add the original xbox to the list as well if, if you're a modder that's comfortable doing that i totally understand if you're paying somebody else to do all the work and that's another cost that you may or may not need but it's certainly something to consider so uh just in general if you're going to be doing xbox modding consider doing that uh, and if you plan on installing the xbox hdmi i would definitely check out this blog post and see exactly which revisions are affected and what the solutions are. Um, and they're even working on a QSB to try to do a quick fix for certain other revisions that need more work, not just the power supply. So overall, if you've installed yours or if you're waiting on getting one to install, you should be fine, but uh, I would definitely check out the post anyway just to see. And I would expect that any kind of video mods for the Xbox would probably run into some similar issues as well. So I would just keep that in mind in case you plan on doing a VG a mod or anything else you know um, any kind of things that have to do with um, longevity of the console I'm trying to find the right words here but basically anything that has to do with capacitors or other components that are eventually going to die would affect more than just one mod anyway so it's something to think about Nicole Branikin, aka Nicole Express, has just posted her second part of a two-part blog series about the Neo Geo CD. And I'll be honest, when I first saw it, I started reading it and thought, oh cool, I'm kind of curious about that, I'll skim through it. And I ended up reading every word. I thought it was really interesting, and I thought the second part of it really tied it all together pretty well. So no spoilers, but essentially the first part concentrates a little more on technical details and the differences between the original and uh, the original Neo Geo consoles as well as the Neo Geo CD and part two goes into some of the game differences and even has a few examples of music differences as well so if you were at all curious about the differences between the, that hardware I would definitely give it a read it is more technically oriented and less of a, a general tech read so you know maybe if you're not interested in the gory details skip to part two and, and go to some of the comparisons but it's it's something I've always been really fascinated by because the whole premise of the Neo Geo CD being released to get those games out to more people that want to play them but can't afford the originals I mean that seemed like a great idea and other than the incredibly long loading time which Nicole describes why that probably happens um, it, it most in most cases seems to be a pretty decent choice but there are technical differences so I, I you know I don't know if there's a, a database somewhere, but I, I definitely think we need some kind of database that goes through each of the Neo Geo CD games and, and describes what they do. Uh, so is it the exact same as the original, but, you know, is it the same but with CD quality music? Is it different because they couldn't handle as much of the graphics processing part of it or not enough memory or whatever, so it's actually a worse experience? And I think there would be it would be a really cool thing to have. So if that already exists, please let me know in the comments and my apologies. And if not, you know, it's something we could add to the you know the wiki that's going to be released alongside the hd retrovision dreamcast cables and the voltar neo geo mod and the badass consoles plug and play some good news for fans of the cdi 
Actually, there's there's a few things CDI related this week, but uh, fans of the CDI should be happy to know that retro gamer stuff is now carrying Mobius Strip Tech's RGB board, which was specifically designed for the top loading CDIs, or I guess any CDI that has the Brooktree encoder in it, as opposed to using like the Sony CXA encoder. And I've spoken about these before. These were designed specifically for those video signals. So no more modifying another amp and hoping that the values are correct. Uh, and on top of that, they pull H and V sync from the main chip before it gets turned into composite video. So it's still 100% safe to use composite and you don't need to worry about sync strippers and any of that stuff. Um, it, it's able to build out all of the circuits exactly the way you would want it to. And a while back, Mobius said that he was open sourcing it under uh, one specific license and no longer going to be producing them. So now I believe the license terms is you could go ahead and build one of these for yourself. Um, and I think uh, under this license, you have to ask permission to be an official reseller of it. I could totally be wrong about that, but I, I gather that that's kind of the situation surrounding it, which I, th I think is pretty fair for everybody. Because if you make your own, that's cool. It's not stopping anybody from making them for you, know, you and a couple of your buddies. And at the same time, having specific retailers ensures that nobody's going to be making some, you know, some crappy version of this with cheap parts that barely doesn't work. So I, I think that's what the situation surrounding it is. But either way, if you have a top loading CDI and you want to get RGB out of it, definitely check this out and uh, search Twitter too, because a bunch of people have been posting pretty cool installation videos and pictures of their stuff. Uh, and I'll have a little thing about that at some point soon um, that at the very least will show the install and show off how cool it looks. Some new research from members of the retro gaming scene have found that the Sega Master System outputs non-linear blue. Now, if you're the type of person that loves an amazing deep dive into technical stuff about video games, I would read this whole post that, including the Google Doc it links to. I do realize that not everybody listening falls into that category, so I'll give the basic overview. Um, it seems that the Sega Master System doesn't quite process blue properly, at least with the Model 1 Sega Master System. Uh, and this is specifically when you're testing with RGB output. And what that actually means in real world performance is when you're using an emulator or FPGA hardware emulation, what you're getting is not a true representation of how a Sega Master System 1 would look. Technically, if you RGB modded a Master System 2, it would look that way, and Genesis is a whole other beast altogether. Uh, so Bernard Bygott went through an insane amount of testing to figure all of this stuff out and do a full analysis to figure out exactly what needs to be done to adjust this. So Bernie was able to make um, a Mednafen color palette that you could use as an overlay to change the way the emulation works in order to get the exact look, or at least close to exact, as close as you could in the analog video world, but a close look to what it would actually be on an original master system hooked up to either a flat panel or a CRT. Um, and this stuff is all really, uh, it's really interesting and it's really neat to me because so many people I know growing up that are a little bit younger played a lot of this stuff only through emulation. So they don't really know what it actually looked like. And one could argue that it doesn't matter if it's a good game, you enjoy playing it either way. But it is pretty neat for preservation purposes and accuracy. And it should also be fairly easy to implement these types of palette adjustments into something like the Mr. Project. So be, um, it would be really cool if work like this was able to be implemented into something where you could press a button and say, this is how it would look if it was exactly real hardware, Model 1 versus Model 2, kind of like the Mr. Team did with audio in the Genesis. That you could have all of the settings to make it sound like a Genesis 1, Genesis 2, etc. Uh, so absolutely awesome work from everybody involved. I hope when this is kind of finalized and when some of the more analysis of how the Genesis processes Master System games gets finished, we could have this as a post up on Retro RGB. Um, and for the record, Bernie put me in the credits in this one, but all I did was take a capture and send it over. All of the hard work was done by himself as well as TN, and uh, I believe Chris Covell even jumped in for some of this. So... Uh, you know, I, I tried to keep it short. I think I'm probably talking a little too long about it just because I'm always excited about uh, reproducing video and audio signals accurately to the original. But uh, if you're interested in this, definitely check out the post. A while back, I talked about a project that 
took a Raspberry Pi and essentially turned it into a scaler for old computers. And it looks like people have extended that project and were able to figure out how to make it work with even newer computers than they originally thought were possible. So basically, they originally thought that you could only do up to 3-bit or 8-color RGB output. And now they're able to figure out ways to get 6-bit, 64 colors, as well as 12-bit or 4096 colors. So what essentially does that mean? That means that you could take something like a Raspberry Pi, one of the smaller ones, the zeros even, and modify it to be installed inside older computers, such as the Amiga 500, and get HDMI output with only buffering a few lines of video. So said in even simpler terms, here's how you take a Raspberry Pi or its variants and wire it into an old computer um, and you're able to get high quality HDMI with pretty much zero lag. Buffering a few lines probably it should be just considered zero anyway. So it's a really interesting project. I remember when I first reached out to the team working on it, I asked if there was absolutely any chance this could be installed in any, uh, any of the more modern retro consoles like Super Nintendo, Genesis, all of that stuff. And they didn't think it was possible, but who knows now with any of these enhancements, maybe it would be. Because if that's the case, then theoretically you might be able to use a Raspberry Pi 4 to scale them to 4K with things like you know, proper CRT scanline overlays and other different weird options. So who knows what the future might hold for this project, but it's incredibly impressive that they were able to take it this far. Uh, so I would highly recommend reading this if you had older computers, especially the Amiga 500, that you were considering some kind of HDMI output, or if you have the ability to work on projects like this and think you might be able to to add something to it and possibly even port it to other consoles or computers. I think that'd be pretty awesome. So thanks very much to everybody that's been working on this. So I finally got a chance to review the Warrior 64 and no surprise here, uh, the case is up to you whether you like it or not. It's certainly built well and the electronics inside are embarrassingly bad. Um, way worse than I actually would have expected. And I gotta be honest, I really didn't wanna review this thing at all. I knew it was gonna suck and I knew what I go through every time I have any kind of negative review because I put an overwhelming amount of pressure on myself when I, anytime I have to say anything negative like that, you know, in the case of like, I do a positive review with one of those like, Oh, but you know, also the thing on the side, I don't really like, you know, I don't really obsess about it too much because it's positive overall. But anytime I'm really harping on something, I do realize that I'm talking about a group of people, some humans that have made something that are trying to sell it so they could presumably put food on their table. And it just, I don't want to say anything negative about something unless it's 100% true. And, you know, to put it in perspective, when I did the negative review of, no, well, the somewhat negative review of that otaku switch, like I legit lost sleep. Like the day after that podcast aired, I remember waking up in the middle of the night like, oh my God, you just gave that thing a bad review and you like that company. Did you test your probe? Did you, you know, did you test the probes probe? You know, did you make any mistake? Are you sure? And I, I did. I went back and, and retested everything all over again just to make sure. And it was accurate. But it's stuff. It's, it's overwhelming, you know. And in this video, I wanted to make sure that every time I said something bad, which was a lot, I had a ton of data to back up that it was fact. Especially because there's always chills and liars out there that'll try to say the opposite opinion of somebody just to get attention, which has clearly already happened in this case. And it's just... I wanted to make sure that everything that I stepped through, like this is the prototype that they said was a prototype. This is the board that they said was production. And they're both terrible and completely and equally different, but bad ways. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it definitely took a lot out of me, but luckily it seems like the feedback has been positive. I tried so hard to put a positive spin on everything. I didn't want a negative feeling video, even though it was a negative review. Um, but you know, as much as I really wanted to just say, ah, this thing stinks, let me walk away. As I said in the video, I thought what this review that I did represented was way bigger than this one stupid project that will hopefully go away and never come back again. You know, it's just, it's this whole thing in general is a reflection on the companies that take advantage of the retro gaming market, knowing that there isn't the best solution available out or you can't get them like the Ultra HDMI. So they they word something very flashy to make it seem like this is the perfect solution. And then they try to contact every shill on the planet and give them a free one in exchange for saying it's awesome. And then you have all the fanboys defending the shills and it's just anybody that's a content creator 
that's on the good side of things or even the neutral side of things completely understands what I'm going or what I'm talking about right now and have gone through the same thing. So that's kind of another reason why I wanted to do this. You know, I wanted to warn everybody about the companies, about the shills, about why this is bad and what to look for. And I think I did a decent enough job. The only thing that I would definitely change about it is that I did a lot of shots of the electronics inside and anybody that's tried knows how unbelievably hard it is to try to do any kind of mod work on camera. So you're you're looking through the LCD of the camera while you're using your soldering iron and you know trying to do what's already a tricky thing anyway. And that's not my place to do at all. My mod work has gotten significantly better since I got upgraded tools a few years ago. And in fact, all the mod work that I showed, there's no cold solder joints, you know, there's there's no shorts. It's not bad, but that's not the point of the video. This wasn't supposed to be a learn how to mod video. So I think with the exception of super, super easy stuff in the future, I would show things like you know, high quality video of what I want to mod with like markings on exactly what needs to be done for people that want to do their own and then mod it off camera where I could take my time and do things like use one ribbon cable for everything and, you know, really spend like an hour modding rather than spend 15 minutes modding and 45 minutes trying to get the right shot. So uh, hopefully, hopefully that kind of, that came across. Okay. I know there were some people that, that harped on the modding, but that was my fault. I really should have concentrated on here's what needs to be done. Here's the after picture of it. And you know, if you need to know how these techniques are done, go watch a Voltar video or something like that. So I will definitely do that in the future. Um, I do want to give away at least one of these warrior 64s and do, you know, do a full giveaway just to help promote the video, to help promote all of the things that I talked about in the video that I just ranted about here. Um, I do want to hold on to it at least one more week, just in case. Um, you know, I, I want to make sure that I haven't heard back from the company, but I want to make sure if they come back and say Bob was lying, I could just open up that console and say, no, I wasn't here. Here's everything proving that I was telling the truth. And also I, I should probably clean up a little bit of the mod work. It is solid, but it doesn't look nearly as nice as I could have done. And it'll never look as nice as hard as I could try, it'll never look as nice as some of the pros that do really amazing work. Because um, I think that is one misconception is it very, you don't have to have something that looks nice for it to work properly. But if, if it does work nice and it was done better overall, um, it'll probably last longer anyway. So, you know, there's of course people that try to make their mods look super fancy, but the soldering work actually, it sucks. But you know, I, I want to try to get it at least to a point where you could open it up and go, oh, that looks cool. <laughs> so, or maybe I'll ask a friend that's better at it than me. I don't know. But overall, it you know, I, I didn't want to talk about this too much here in, in this video, but I guess I did anyway, because obviously this one took a lot of time and it took a lot out of me. So real quick shout out and thank you to Metal Jesus for paying out of pocket for, uh, to send me these. Really appreciated that I was able to get uh, to get a good look at what these things did and, and how bad they are. Uh, a thank you and a shout out to Mike Chi for sending me a Rad 2X to use in this. It was really awesome. Uh, thank you to Ash as well as Mike and all my other friends, but especially Ash Evans in this case for really answering an obscene amount of questions and spending quite a bit of time with me going over and making sure that everything I said was right and, and really giving me the background to understand that I can prove now if somebody asks me exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, and shout out to Voltar for uh, sending me two of the RGB boards. He made me pay for both of them. Thanks, Zach. Really appreciate that. But he sent them to me relatively on time anyway. Chimeric Systems just sold out of another pre-order of their Xbox HDMI adapters, but more are coming soon, so I figured I would take a moment to talk about it and just remind people or uh, talk to newcomers about what this is. So essentially, it's an analog to digital converter and a pigtail style cable for the original Xbox that outputs HDMI in any of the resolutions that the original Xbox supports. As far as analog to digital conversion goes, it's about as good as you could possibly get for the original Xbox. You could have uh, at least an equal solution if you get shielded quality component video cables and a decent quality analog to digital basic generic converter. Uh, you know, depending on the converter you get, it'll be about the same. Uh, the Chimeric Systems one might be a little better. 
Technically speaking, anytime you have a digital to digital mod, like the Make Megahertz one I spoke about earlier, you're going to get a better signal. However, I don't know if you'd ever be able to tell the difference in current scalers. So someday when we have 480p to 8k scalers, you'd probably be able to tell the difference. But just plugging this into your average 1080p or 4k TV and having your TV do the scaling, I don't know if you'd notice the difference between a digital to digital or analog to digital solution. I certainly didn't at all. Um, I'm by no means the Xbox expert, but I do kind of know what to look for, and I, I didn't notice anything that way. However, if you use a bad analog to digital solution, like a lot of those crappy adapters that are out there already, you will see a difference. Now, the ones for the Xbox don't add lag. None of the solutions do, I believe. So if you're looking for something to hold you over and you want to spare, grabbing one of the $20 ones isn't a terrible idea. You're just going to notice color differences, interference on screen, and a lot of the other stuff I talked about in the video. So... Basically, if you want a plug and play solution for your original Xbox, this is the one to get and more pre-orders should be available in about a month. Uh, and also the giveaway today has to do with the Xbox. So if you missed out on this one, try it for the giveaway. More info on that later on. Hoskinson Industries are now selling replacement cartridge shells for Atari Jaguar games. Um, they come in three different colors. One is black, which I believe probably matches the original one. I haven't seen them in person, but based on the pictures, they look close to the original. Those are $3.50 each. And then there's also yellow and transparent blue, which are $7 each, which I think is awesome for people that want to make their own homebrew for the Atari Jaguar and not have to cannibalize an existing game just to use its shell or have an open PCB or whatever else. Um, you know, and I always have tons of respect for people that take the time to make stuff like this because you're not going to sell a million of these things. You know, this really is to support a smaller group of people. And I think that everybody that is either a homebrew game maker or even just giant fans of the Jaguar that want to buy a new homebrew would really appreciate knowing that no one's destroying a Jaguar game in order to make a new one. You could just use this shell. Um, it's the same company that sold the Jaguar Pro Controller, uh, and while that was received pretty well, I think everybody that got it agreed that the plastic was high quality, so I would assume that these are also. Uh, also, the, the people that were designing these said that they could possibly do a full Jaguar replacement shell, but it would be kind of expensive, certainly not in the dollars range. I would assume at least 100 bucks for something like that. I'm kind of interested to see if there's a market for it because most of the broken Jaguars I've seen had broken motherboards and components, not broken shells. Uh, so I don't know if that's something, you know, please let me know in the comments if I'm wrong. Is there a big market for aftermarket Jaguar shells? Uh, I know that there was a run of clear ones that happened a while back, but I don't really know how many were available. And I do think that something like that might be better put towards other projects like the Jaguar Duo project that we talked about last year, which I don't think it's gone very far, but essentially uh, it was, you know, go back and look it up uh, if you want more details, because I could talk about that for hours. So I'll just say it's a way to have a combination Jaguar, Jaguar CD all in one console with, you know, a custom motherboard. It was a really neat idea. I don't know if it went anywhere, but um, it's certainly something that I think a fully injection molded custom case would really uh, be a very good match to it. So if you want more info on that, the link's in the post. Uh, and if you just want to buy some replacement Jaguar cartridge shells, all the links are there as well. There's a new controller adapter that's in the works for the Philips CDI consoles that allows you to use USB devices with your CDI, which is important for a couple of different reasons. First, the CDI controllers themselves are pretty expensive, so any alternative option would always be a good thing. And there's already pretty decent existing ones for the Super Nintendo and Genesis out there that allow you to use those controllers on it, which I think overall would be cheaper than trying to hunt down some of the not-so-great quality anyway original CDI controllers. But I think the much more important factor is that very often with the CDI, you would actually want to use a mouse 
and sometimes even a keyboard depending on the game. So just using a controller isn't always the best option. And there's a project that was started that's now open source called the USB to CDI. And at the moment, you can program it to use USB controllers, but they're still working on having things like USB keyboard and mouse support. Um, so overall, if you're a fan of the CDI, this is definitely exciting because you don't have to spend a ton of money on a bunch of accessories. You could just pick up one of these adapters when they're available and then use standard USB stuff and probably even wireless USB stuff if you're into that as well. Um, I normally don't trust wireless anything, but in the context of a keyboard and mouse, it should be fine for gaming. Um, the only thing I would say, though, is a lot of these projects uh, very often get to the point where they're completed, but then nobody makes any. You know, there's a small run for the creator and their buddies, and that's pretty much it. So I do really hope that this takes off and this turns into something that people could actually buy. Uh, you know, I don't know if the creator of the project is interested in doing that, and if not, there are some awesome people in the retro gaming world that will stand up and make stuff like this, whether it's low-quality runs that are low quantity <laughs> sorry high quality low quantity runs of stuff that might be a little bit more expensive uh, but still make them available to everybody or for other stuff it could just be one um, you know very high volume run that gets everything out very cheap to everybody and is handled by one main store so either way uh, I really hope the developer looks into either making them or having them made because once this is complete or at the very least in a state where it works with USB controllers and then you're able to update it in the future uh, update the software on it I think once it's at that state uh, a lot of you, uh, a lot of CDI owners would probably pick one up, even if they already had the controller, just so they could have a wider variety of stuff to use with it, including you know more keyboard and mouse options. The PlayStation Dungeon Crawler game Magic Castle has finally been released after 23 years. Apparently, the game was developed on the NetEurose official homebrew kit that was sold with the original PlayStation. If you'd like more info on that, definitely check out Modern Vintage Gamer's video on that. Uh, but the game was started and never completed, and then the original team that made it came back and finished it off recently and was able to release it to, uh, for anybody that wants to play it. Um, you could play this on emulation or on original har hardware, either with optical drive emulators or mod chips or whatever else. And it seems like a really interesting game. Uh, and it has some unique features that uh, I guess at the time were certainly revolutionary and even some that I don't often see, like the ability to move around your heads up display and move and change where things are located. I think that alone is kind of a neat thing. Um, and other than that, it just, it seems like an impressive dungeon crawler. You know, you go through and try to find a key that uh, depending on what level you're in, it could be in a random enemy or in a specific place. And um, you also have to kind of trade off your stuff in order to get past certain levels. I don't want to really tell any uh, any spoilers about it, but if you're interested, definitely check out Dan's post. Um, it, it certainly seems like something that anybody that was interested in dungeon crawlers or just game history in general might want to take a look at this to see what it offers. It's certainly something that I want to make time for at some point, but uh, check it out. And it's available for download uh, right from the link in the post if you're interested. It looks like pre-orders are now open for the officially licensed reprint of Iron Soldier 3 for the Nuon. I guess the company Songbird Productions was gauging interest about a month ago to see if it would even be worth doing, and I guess they got some positive feedback and decided to do it. So uh, if you have a Nuon or plan on getting one, now you could get an officially licensed game. This isn't like a hacker reprint. This is an actual officially printed game that's Iron Soldier 3 for the Nuon. And to be perfectly honest, I would totally buy this if I thought I could stumble across a Nuon pretty cheap somewhere. Um, but I don't remember... I, I definitely haven't had the opportunity to buy one, and I think the only time I ever remember seeing it was maybe in like a Circuit City back when it was first released or something like that. So kind of a neat thing. Very cool to see um, a pretty... Uh, a very niche console get a re-release on it like this but hey if you have a new one and you want another game for it pick this one up <laughs> okay giveaway time while I do absolutely plan on giving away at least one of those Warrior 64s, I want to wait another week or so just to wait for everything to blow over. So to hold us off, I want to give away an Xbox to Wii Component Pro. Um, kind of funny, a while back, Jan from Consoles for You sent me one of these. Um, I used it in a video, and I was supposed to do a giveaway with it, and then I totally forgot about it 
like an ass. I'm really sorry. Absolutely unintentional. Uh, so I figured now was the perfect time because uh, I talked about the giveaway for the Warrior, but you know I don't want to do it yet. And also, uh, I talked about an Xbox HDMI adapter that you can't get. So I figured this was the perfect opportunity. Uh, and I'm even going to throw out of my own pocket a set of pretty much brand new HD RetroVision Wii cables so that you could actually just plug this and the cables I send directly into an original Xbox and get a very, very high quality shielded signal out of it. Uh, and in fact, these, the set that I'll send you along with the cheap $20 analog to digital converter, I always have those linked in the Amazon store in the descriptions, by the way, but uh, that should give you a pretty similar output. And this also has the um, optical audio connector on the back as well. So you could have full digital audio as well as analog audio and analog video. So thank you very much, Dion, for giving me one of these. Uh, really sorry that I forgot about it. So uh, I've, hopefully I'll make up for it now, especially now that people might really need one of these things if they've been waiting for the Chimeric adapter and uh, aren't able to pick one up or anything like that. So this plus my own personal uh, Wii cables from HD Retrovision, which are still in the box, and I think I've only used them for B-roll in the videos that you've seen. <laughs> Those are out of stock too, so I'll, uh, you know, that's a, another kind of cool bonus. Now I'll leave a link to where you can get those when they are back in stock, as well as a link to this, of course. Um, how to win this? Just post the word giveaway below. I'm going to use the same random comment picker that I did in the giveaways last year. Those seem to work perfect, and it also filters out doubles, so there's no, read to, no reason to post more than once or post giveaway 100 times in the same comment. Um, just post the word giveaway, and you'll be eligible, uh, and I will draw the winner next week right as the podcast opens. So thank you very much again to Jan, and I'm very, very sorry for for just forgetting about this. It's in fact been sitting on my desk right in front of me for months now. And I put it there so I wouldn't forget about it. And it's kind of like that street that you drive by every day. You know how to get to and from the store, but if you said, well, name all of the streets in between, you wouldn't know because you see it every day and you don't even pay attention. I think it was the same thing. So my apologies for that. Uh, I'll draw the winner next week and uh, hopefully somebody will get themselves a much needed component video solution for the original Xbox. Okay, that's it for this week. As always, thanks so much to everybody that watches, listens, plays nicely in the comments. And of course, and especially thank you to everybody that supports on any of the support services like Patreon or Floatplane, because it's you all that are keeping all of this going. So thank you all very much, and I'll see you next week.